On today's episode, we talk about generosity, innovation, and how the best leaders get people fired up about the mission. After that, we talk about how to be a more generous leader by investing in your community. From the Ramsey Network, I'm George Camel, and this is the Entree Leadership Podcast, where we help business leaders like you grow themselves, their teams, and their profits. Coming up, I talk with Scott Harrison, founder and CEO of Charity Water, a nonprofit focused on bringing clean water to everyone on earth. He's also the best-selling author of the book Thirst and gives all of the proceeds from the book back to the mission of clean water for all. He's been recognized in Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list, the Forbes Magazine Impact 30 list, and was recently number 10 in Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business issue. We talk about how he scaled Charity Water over the past 15 years, affecting 15 million people, all through innovation and transparency. He also shares why the best tribes are built around an enthusiastic, mission-oriented leader. Let's dive into my conversation with Scott. Scott, it's so great to have you back on the podcast. How you been? I've been great. It's nice to be back. You were on back in 2018, yes. but it was virtually. That's and it's right. great to have you in person. It feels like a decade has happened in those, what, five years now. Yes. Amazing. Yes, it's nice to be here in person. Pretty, pretty nice setup. Moments ago, you spoke to our entire Ramsey team sharing the Charity Water story. Many people know it. If you don't know it, you can go check out the previous episode where you share more of that. But I want to get Great. into more of the business side today yes. and leadership side because there's a re some really interesting angles uh, that you've done with Charity Water in the past 15 years. Yep. I mean, we just turned 15. Wow. Almost, you're almost able to drive. My it's gosh, amazing. I know. It feels like 150 sometimes. <laughs> so here's my question for you. You have an interesting journey to leadership because you didn't really, like, raise your hand to be a CEO. Right. So did you want to be a CEO? Was that part of the, the vision of the picture? No, I still don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, founder was, was an interesting idea. I mean, back then— there wasn't the term social entrepreneur, but that's what that's what I'd be called now. Yeah, it's hip um, now. Yeah, entrepreneurism. You were doing is, it before. Very, it was cool. Very hip. Um, I think it was just I had a very clear vision and mission, and then you start. So I was very good at let's just start. Let's just have a flurry of activity that hopefully will move the mission forward. And then oh, well, we need to hire somebody, and then we need to hire someone else, and then you know the next thing you know you've got a team and <laughs> you've got to make payroll and. <laughs> All uh, that a real, part hits. A, a real organization. So I've had to learn so many different techniques, uh, I guess, over the, you know, different skills over the years. I've had coaching, a lot of coaching over the years. But I remember, uh, I think it was Ben Horowitz, uh, Silicon Valley VC, wrote a blog once, and he said, a good CEO only needs to do three things. Have a compelling vision for the company or the organization. Keep money in the bank. Right, so fund it. Don't run out of money, and then hire amazing people. So I, I don't know. I think that simplified that, that's, it for you. That, that simplified it for me. I'm like, okay, well, I think I can hire smarter people than than me, and always I get that concept. Okay, funding, I get that concept. I just need to make sure we've got runway and we never run out of cash. And the compelling vision was actually really easy: a world where every human being has clean water to drink. Right? We're on a mission. I mean, not very creative with the name Charity Water, but we're a charity that helps people get water. And I thought that mission would really get a lot of people excited. Yeah. Everybody could agree on humans having clean drinking water. Yeah, it's a bipartisan issue. So here we like are 15 say. years later. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, you've built an amazing company with an amazing mission and affected a lot of people. How many people now have been affected by clean water projects? We just crossed 15 million people uh, in our 15th year. Wow. So we did that in, in December, actually. So we raised about $700 million. Uh, last year was our first $100 million donation year, wow. which was exciting. That was kind of a—so last year was a year of milestones. Um, you 15 know, now, year, 15 yeah, million like, people. I got to say, you know, $100 million a year is a fraction of what we should be raising, a fraction of, of the capital that we should be deploying at— at this problem, at this global problem. So I feel like we're in the second inning. I mean, this is definitely the best is yet to become. You know, it's taken us 15 years to build the machine, to build a transparent and effective, you know, efficient organization. Now I think it's time for the real growth. Yeah. Well, most leaders and, and business owners would go, $100 million a year, I'd kill for that. That's amazing. But when it comes to your mission, 
I mean, you've affected 15 million people out of the 771 yeah. million out there. Right, who so that's one clean fiftieth. Water. So, so in that perspective, you feel like, oh, I got a long way to go. If you're talking about TAM or market share, right? Yeah. How do you and balance that where you go, we've accomplished so much, and yet we're barely scratching the surface? Does that get you excited, or is it ever defeating? It, it gets me excited. I mean, I think more about run rate and progress. So <laughs> just in the last month, we raised what it took us four and a half years to raise. Mm. So you, I kind of think about, you know, the, if I keep charting out – growth in the future. So this year, the budget is $130 million, so 30% growth. You know, if we keep doing that, the numbers get really exciting, and the amount of people, which is what it's all about, served, starts to exponentially increase. Wow. So, you know, today I think we're going to get 5,600 new people clean water for the first time, and then again tomorrow, and then again on Friday, and then again on Saturday, and then again on Sunday. So that's kind of the KPI is moving people from the $771 million without water, the tenth of the world without, to the width. And then there's an end point. You know, we believe that there is a day on earth that we can see where everybody drinks clean water. Yeah, I hope that happens in your lifetime. That would be really cool. I know. So it's exciting. So we, we're excited about the future. Awesome. Well, you started Charity Water wanting to do things differently. Of course, you had your mission, but you also saw a big problem with nonprofits and charities and how they were run and the perception around them. How did you want to solve those with what you were doing with Charity Water? Well, I think I had the advantage of just not knowing any better. So I was a 30-year-old kid. My only previous experience was 10 years of running around nightclubs as a promoter and then a volunteer mission, you know, taking pictures uh, in West Africa with a medical mission. So in a way, I just didn't – I had no philanthropic experience. and I didn't know how charities were supposed to operate. I was just talking to everyday people, and I realized that everyday people – my friends in New York City just didn't trust charities. They weren't giving. They all had the kind of, you know, horror story of mismanaged funds that they could pull out of their back pocket and say, see, you know, these crooks, this is why I don't give money to organizations like that. So as I dove a little deeper, I guess this was kind of, you know, informal market research, I realized it was all about where does the money go? How much of the money will actually go to the cause? And there was one billionaire uh, who had solved the biggest problem I was hearing, and he had set up a foundation. He said, I will pay all of the overhead myself so that 100% of whatever one ever gives, this was for New York City public education uh, or, or for education in marginalized communities in New York, 100% of whatever is given will go straight to the cost. So, of course, I wrote him. He's a very famous hedge fund manager. I wrote him a letter. He never got back to me. But I said, look, he's taken the number one problem, and he's just neutered it. So we did that. We said, we'll promise that 100% of all donations will go directly to the field. And in a separately audited bank account, I am going to raise all that nasty overhead staff salary Epson copy toner That isn't exciting to give to. But I believe that entrepreneurs and business leaders would want to build the business. They would want to build the organization. They would want to pay the talented staff uh, if given that value proposition. So we've really run church and state, two separately audited bank accounts now for 15 years, and we have never had a hard time funding the overhead yeah. to keep up with the, the other growth. That's amazing. And just, you know, today at scale, 130 families pay all the overhead. Wow. Millions of donors get to give in the purest way where whether they give a dollar or a hundred dollars or a million dollars, a hundred percent of that goes. So this model has worked for us and the problem we were trying to solve. I don't push it on others. I don't kind of, it, it's incredibly difficult because you've got to balance these two very disparate asks and, you know, run a more complex business or organization. But it's, it's really worked for us. It's been a competitive advantage. Yeah, transparency in business is becoming more and more important for anyone who supports a company. They want to know what's going on especially in the yes. nonprofit world. So not only have you done transparency well, but you've done innovation really well in the nonprofit space. Talk to me about some of the things that you've accomplished over the years with innovation and where you guys are at today. I mean, I think just the first idea going was, was a transparency idea. Let's put up every water project we fund on Google Earth and Google Maps. And this was free, but you had to go out there and do it from day one. So we bought these Garmin devices and we would have our local partners in Ethiopia or Malawi, you know, or Bangladesh, take a picture of the GPS readout, send us the photo of the well, and then we would upload all that. So that was kind of our first just big idea. Um, 
one one of the ideas that I'm really proud of uh, more recently, which has been a, a hugely complex project, is creating smart wells. So in the same way that you know, if you've got a nest, you can leave your house and control, you know, know what's going on in the temperature of your house. We wanted to put wells in the most rural areas online. So when a well breaks, it would report its non-functionality up to the cloud, and a repair team could be dispatched wow. to get that community drinking clean water. So we won a $5 million innovation grant from Google, spent another $5 million of R&D, again, all raised separately, and now we've got thousands and thousands of sensors out there monitoring over a billion liters from the most marginalized rural communities in the world, uh, all to the end technology solving the problem of keeping clean water flowing for years to come. Wow. So that's been, you know, something that's incredibly difficult, working with 28 different labs and, you know, manufacturing in China and chip shortages and all the myriad complexities yeah. that, that we've had to deal with over the last couple of years. But is, could just be game-changing for the water sector. And this is all open source. So this is not even proprietary technology. We want other governments, we want other NGOs to use this. That's really cool. And on top of that innovation, you've also innovated the business model and how people give. And as we've moved towards a subscription model, you guys jumped on that as well, and you grew exponentially because of it. Yeah, so we got stuck in kind of the 30s, in 30 million or so in donations. And I was lucky enough to be in Ethiopia in the back of a Land Rover with the founder of Spotify, a guy called Daniel Eck. And uh, I was telling him my business model, and he's like, dude, it sucks, your business model. He's like, January 1, your ticker rolls back to zero, and then you have to go and you know, do, it all over do it all over again and then grow. He said, you know, I acquire a user, and I just build on my base. I want to acquire a Spotify you know, member for life and deliver value and content over life. So I, I remember, you know, thinking, you know, okay, well, the sponsor a child, they've been doing that for years, but I don't have a child who can write letters. So what's my product? So then eventually I just came back from that trip and said, okay, I'm going to start it. And we launched this community called The Spring. And a uh, very simple idea. It costs $40 to get one person clean water. 100% of the money goes. And we said, there's a lot of people that could do two Netflixes a month. There's a lot of people that could do one Netflix a month for clean water. And we just marketed around this subscription product that you got nothing in return. No music, no movies, no free shipping Imagine from Amazon, that. no place to store your photos or documents. But 100% of the value was passed on to people who needed clean water. That took us from, you know, the 30s to $100 million a year organization. So it's really so much of the growth has been powered by $30, $40 a month givers, but who are giving constantly and loyally and that base that we can grow upon. So that's now, we have spring members in 149 countries now. Wow. It's turned into a global program. And as I get excited about that, like Netflix has like 200 million people paying every month, right? We're not, we're, we're getting close to 100,000. So the opportunity is so big. Surely there are a million people who can care about clean water every single month. Right? Well, that would yeah. 10x our impact. What about 10 million people? So can that's, we, that's can where we I think just the growth get is gonna Netflix and Spotify to go, hey, to do you want to add $5 right? dollars for clean water? Oh my gosh. Or that $5. would be amazing. It would be. We've asked. No, no luck yet. I think it, I think it hurts the conversion. Funnel. Sure, sure. Well, my wife and I are a part of the spring, and it's an honor to support such an amazing mission. And one thing you've done really well is built a tribe around a problem that you're trying to solve. And a lot of the, the past charities that you've seen, you know, the old school commercials, you give out of pity. There's no excitement around it. You just feel bad, and you go, all right, here's five bucks. Like, it's a guy on the side of the road. But you've you done something. friends about that, church. No, but you've done something where you've built a tribe around people who are excited and honored and proud, and they want to share it. How can leaders adopt that kind of model? Yeah, I think it's a transfer of enthusiasm. So we are deeply, passionately enthusiastic about our work providing humans clean drinking water in a transparent, effective, measurable, provable way. So, you know, I think it's we, we market and message around hope and opportunity and invitation, not guilt and shame. You know, it's not give because you have to or I saw your car and it's nice or your house. You know, I saw where you went on, went on vacation. You know, the, the great brands in the world, no one does this. You know, that would be as if Nike told America they were fat and lazy, you know, and asked them to go buy running shoes. You know, Nike actually does the opposite. They tell people that, 
you know, we believe there's greatness inside you. They tell stories of people overcoming adversity, right? Nike believes if you are blind, you're going to climb Mount Everest. And, and then people kind of rise to that occasion because they are inspired by the stories there. So we've really just taken more of a Nike or Apple or, or Virgin approach to storytelling and creativity. And if you just look at fundraising, the first three letters are fun. You know, it is Put fun. Put the fun back in fundraising. Right? It's fun to give of your, your time and your money and your talent in the service of others. So we spend a lot of time just thinking about how to close the loop, how to show people that their money is making a difference, how to show uh, the people who are being helped by these donations. So we put a lot of money into the infrastructure there of that kind of donor feedback loop where people don't feel like the money's just going into a void. You just give and forget. You give and forget. And that's the old charitable subscription model, by the way, is like, let's get George to sign up He'll feel and like then a better hope person. he forgets. So we're trying to win the donation every single month. So that's how we think about it is let's remind you that you are giving. We're taking more money out of your bank account. And, you know, instead of saying, what's Charity Water done for me lately? What's Charity Water done for me right now? Well, here's the impact report or here's a new story of of the impact this community is making. That's amazing. Well, uh, so many people have been inspired by your story, Charity Waters organization, and the work you guys are doing. And I've heard you have thoughts about the phrase, give back. Yeah. What, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I just don't like that because it's it makes it implies that you've taken, right? We have pillaged and plundered to such extent. Let's throw some scraps Restitution. back. Restitution, yeah. Right, let's throw some scraps back. It's like if I, you know, snatch this from you, you might say, give it back. Right? Give back. Giving, I just think giving should be framed in the positive. Um, our family has a culture of giving and generosity. We look for ways to give our time, to give our resources. Our company, our small business, you know, here's our giving strategy. Here's our giving ethos. Not our, you know, giving the scraps back because we've, we've taken too much. Yeah. So I just, I think it's just more inspirational when you drop the back and just talk about giving, and it becomes more infectious. And then you look for new and interesting ways to give more. The more you give, the more you give. It's Ooh, like a muscle. Like that. The more you give, the more you give. The more you want to be of service, the more you want to be generous. That's incredible. And one of our ethos is the same. I mean, Dave Ramsey, live and give like no one else, outrageous generosity. This is a pillar of Ramsey, and it's a pillar of, I think, great organizations and great leadership. So here's what I want to end on. Whether or not you're in the nonprofit space, a lot of leaders yeah. listening, they may not be in that space, but I think all leaders should be focused on service and generosity and some type of redemptive, restorative work and solving and problems. And all of the workers are demanding this you know, in an increasing way, yeah. you know, especially as you go out and you hire young people for your companies or your causes, they insist that there is a greater purpose, that your company or your small business is engaged in, you know, ending some of the suffering in your local community or the global community. Yeah, nobody and, wants to feel like a cog in the wheel who's just punching in, punching out for a paycheck. And that it's done with integrity, right? That it's yeah. not just, oh, let's do some CSR, just to, you know, shut everybody up. Yeah. They want to know that there is, there is a real uh, integrity of intent. So how can those leaders who may or may not be in the nonprofit space who are inspired by your story, but they're not sure how they can make that kind of impact. Maybe it's not a global impact like you're doing, but maybe it's even their community. How would you encourage them? Yeah, I think start. I mean, start with a cause that is that you're passionate about, that you think maybe your, your team members would be passionate about. Um, it was water for me because I saw people drinking dirty water. And I was like, not on my watch. You know, this is crazy. Like a guy like me could sell $10 bottles of water in a nightclub and yet... 10% of the world is drinking from swamps and ponds and rivers. I'm going to go and solve this problem. Um, you know, my, my wife and I, you know, our family, we give to a lot of causes that, that we're passionate about. It's typically an inspired leader that comes to us, and we want to serve that leader's mission. It, it's typically less that we go looking for the cause, but someone transfers the enthusiasm of their passion for the cause, if it's trafficking or shelter or, uh, you know, or a hunger issue, they transfer that to us and we say, we just want to help you grow. We want to help you accomplish the mission. So, you know, maybe it's finding that social entrepreneur that you can come alongside and, and scale and grow and encourage and fund. 
Well, Scott, I appreciate you for who you are, your leadership, what Charity Water has done and will continue to do. And it reminds me of Dave's momentum theorem, where it Mm. says focus intensity over time multiplied by God equals unstoppable momentum. And that's exactly what I think when I think about the work you're doing with Charity Water and uh, you'll continue to do. So thanks so much for being back on the podcast. Thanks for having me back. Huge thanks to Scott for coming by the Entree Leadership Studio. Such an inspiring conversation. If you want to grab a copy of his book, Thirst, or learn more about Charity Water and Give, we've got links for you in the show notes. So as leaders, we need to be generous, service-oriented problem solvers. And while you're probably inspired by Scott's story, it may feel out of reach to make a global impact through your leadership. So what does this look like for you and me as we lead in our local communities? How can we still have incredible impact right here in our zip codes? To talk about that, I'm sitting down with Jim King. He's the executive vice president of Ramsey Education, and we're going to talk about the relationship between leadership and generosity and simple ways that you can invest in your community. Here's our conversation. Jim, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. So I was just talking with Scott Harrison, and I want to get your take on this. What, in your mind, is the relationship between leadership and generosity? Man, that's a great question, and Scott Harrison's doing phenomenal things with his charity. Um... You know, the biggest thing I've seen with the relationship to leadership is it really enhances their leadership skills. As a leader, the more generous you are, the more compassionate, the more empathy you're going to have towards your teams that you're leading, that you're working with. And so it's just a, it's a great way to, to not only give back to your, your team members, but to grow as a leader yourself. Yeah, and everyone wants to work alongside a compassionate, generous oh, leader. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And that, that, I mean, it's a character trait at the end of the day to be yeah. a generous person. Yes. And there's actions associated with that. So I want to talk about what you guys are doing over at Ramsey Education as you lead that team that is impacting communities around the nation. Yeah. Obviously, you know, Scott Harrison, Charity Water, global impact. But you're really, you're zooming in into local communities all over the country, small towns, big cities. What are some of the ways that you guys do that? Man, we do it a lot of different ways, but the biggest way is we provide a curriculum to schools. And so in that curriculum, we weave generosity and giving all throughout the curriculum. It's really one of the pillars, one of the foundational principles that we teach. And so when a student's going through the curriculum, every chapter's got some component on giving and being generous. And so that they're learning that behavior that, hey, when I make money, when I'm when I'm out of high school and I'm starting to make some real dollars, I've got to make giving a part of my daily routine, my weekly routine and my budgets. And so it just really helps when they learn that at a young age because then they can start applying it when they become an adult. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and we were talking before we got started about Entree Leadership clients and event attendees. They're always going, man, and my, I wish my team members went yeah. through this kind of curriculum so they had a handle on money before I got a hand on them. And yeah. now they're going, hey, dude, I don't know how to handle my money. Yeah. And now I, I'm demanding raises right. and right. it's just not enough money. Right. And they're stressed out about it. And exactly. Then, but when they handle their money well, they come to work for you as a team member. Well, now they can focus on what you've hired them to do. They can focus on work because that money stress is not a big part of a big part of what they're carrying. So yeah. And that, at the end of the huge. day, if they can if they can handle their money well and they can do what God's created them to do, that'd be the end of the world. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Man. Yeah, that's a really cool mission you guys are on. And it's working. Uh, 48% of the schools nationwide uh, use our curriculum, which is incredible and amazing. But clearly, the work is not done yet. That means there's 52% that's out right. there who are <laughs> not, who don't have this curriculum. They may not have any kind of personal finance yeah. teaching in schools. Uh, with, you know, millions of kids around the country that need this, what are the challenges in the education space in particular that's holding kids back from learning this stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, There's two main challenges, two big challenges that we face working with schools. The first one is time, and the second one is money. The the time comes into play is because you have a fixed amount of time in a school day. You are in a school from... 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., whatever the time frame is. And if you want to put a course or a class into that channel, something else has to be removed. They're not going to add an hour to the school day to teach personal finance or to teach anything else. And so it's always a challenge to get time allocated in the school day to teach the topic. The second thing that comes into play is uh, funding, money. Schools traditionally don't have a lot of money, and so they tend to be broke or have very low budgets. And so when they want to teach a personal finance course, if they get it approved and it's now in the channel to be taught, that's great. Well, now would, now they have to go pick out a curriculum. And so when the budgets are tight as they are, funding is always an issue that we're dealing with, which is why uh, 
we work with a lot of companies around the com- country to, to help us fund the curriculum for schools. Yeah, it's a really cool business model you guys have developed. And, you know, being a, a business leader here at Ramsey, and you're kind of beholden to the schools out there and what they're able to do. And so a really cool thing you've done is partner with local businesses and, and private donors who just say, you know what, I want to help my community get this curriculum because I think that's going to make my community better. Yes. That's yep. really cool. Yeah, very much so. And the, and the companies really like to do that because even in today's day and age, um, customers are looking at companies, their brand loyalty comes from what are these people doing in their communities? What are these companies giving back? How are they giving back? How are they impacting their communities? And that's one thing as a customer we look for. And so being able to to tie those together and give uh, companies the opportunity has been great. And I had the pleasure of hosting our newest high school curriculum, and I had a blast doing it. And the, what makes it all worth it to me, because I put a lo- we put a lot of time and effort into this project and into the scripts and videos to make them engaging for the teens watching, but I love seeing the impact. I love getting messages saying, hey, you make, you know, learning about money fun, and I love watching the personal finance curriculum. Do you have a particular story that impacted you that kind of keeps you going and reminds you what the mission's all about? Yeah, uh, we have so many stories. It's been fantastic because we work with hundreds of companies around the country. But one in particular is a guy named Bob Hull from uh, Hull Roofing uh, out of Indiana, and he sponsored a few schools for us. And one day he was having a team meeting back at his office, and they ran out of plastic cups, just something simple. So he's like, I'm going to jump in the truck, company truck, and drive down to the convenience store and, and get some more cups. So he goes in the convenience store, he grabs the cups, goes up to the cash register to pay, and the person working there was 18, 19 years old, and he said, hey, I got the cups. I'll take care of them. And and Bob was like, no, we can pay for the cups. And he goes, no, you don't understand. I saw the truck you pulled in. I saw the name on the side of the truck. And you guys sponsored the curriculum in our local high school. And it radically changed my life. Wow. And it was such an impactful moment. And so I, I got the cups. It's not a big deal. And so Bob left the store and he was just blown away. He couldn't believe the impact that his curriculum was having. And he saw firsthand this one student, how he's the student has said his life has changed just from going through that course. And so that was pretty awesome. So hearing stories, stories like that, from all over the country. It just really fuels our fire and gets ex- gets us excited to find even more people to be on the journey with us. Yeah, and it's so cool when you're supporting something in your local community because yes. this is the place that you live. You go to this grocery store. Absolutely. Your kid goes to the school. And yeah. so there's some really cool impact that you get to see firsthand mm-hmm. um, you know, by sponsoring the curriculum. So I love what your team's doing there. Yeah. So Jim, we know that leadership, generosity, service, it's all intertwined together. So how would you encourage the leaders out there who are inspired by this episode, this conversation? They want to do more. They want to be givers. They want their team to get involved. How would you encourage them to do that in their community? Yeah, that's a great question. I would really say to somebody, look for what's important in your community. You, you know, you're a local company, most likely you're serving the members of your community. So find out what it is that the, your community needs. Sometimes it could be homelessness that you deal with. It could be uh, food banks that you need to deal with. It could be disaster relief of something that just happened. Whatever it is that's passionate to you and, and or to your company or your teammates, find out what that is and just dial it in and go after it that way. Yeah. Just get creative and even getting the team involved. And hey, what ideas do you have? What are you guys passionate about? There's some really cool things that can happen from that. Because you got teammates that are generally working on the community too, and you're going to find out what they're passionate about and, and find out what those needs are. Yeah. Well, Jim, I love what you're doing for financial literacy for literally millions of kids around the country. Uh, the hope, the inspiration, the education, uh, it's going to impact the next workforce that, that we're going to see with, you know, Gen Z starting to yeah. get out there and, the leaders listening, they're the ones hiring these people. And so the fact that they could hire people who have that financial literacy, who can be better employees, better team members, yeah. better leaders themselves, that inspires me. So love the work you're doing. Thanks for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, George. It was great. Thanks so much, Jim. Love the impact you and your team are having every single day. As Jim mentioned, we have an opportunity for you to invest in your local community and in the next generation. If you want to learn more about sponsorship, you can use the link in the show notes. Hope you enjoyed today's episode of the show. If you did, I want to challenge you to share this with three people on your team or in your circle. And if you really enjoyed it, leave us a review and tell us what you love about it. There's one guy in particular who would love to hear what you think about this, and his name is Tim, and he's the producer. He wants to know what you like, what you don't like, and what improvements we could make. Your input helps shape what you hear on this podcast, which is really cool. So go ahead and use the link in the show notes to connect with our producer, Tim. If you want to keep up with us on social media, you can follow us at Entree Leadership. This episode was produced by Tim Hull, edited by Jacob Harrison, and mixed and mastered by Will Rudder. 
I'm your host, George Camel, and on behalf of the entire Entree Leadership team, thanks for listening. Until next time, keep learning and keep leading.